Russell Brand is indisputably now an A-list star. And what a journey he's had from drug addict to Hollywood superstar. That's why! And I intend to ask him how he's done it. Piers Morgan seems like a pleasant kind of a chap. Arsenal fan, relatively tall. It's really a question of what you don't ask him, because he's done just about every single thing any human being could possibly do in their lives. He's been up and down more times than a hyperactive yo-yo. Nice one. Here we are. You're a happily married man to the delightful Katy Perry. Yeah. What's it like settling down, being calm, not being this rampant Lothario? It doesn't feel like settling down because, like, it's still very, very active and a lot to do, right? Because my wife, she's like, <clears throat> I thought women was difficult to deal with until I tried dealing with woman. Because <laughs> <laughs> then there's only one. And then you've got to do that, you've got to negotiate what that one specifically wants. They change that. And she's quite feisty, your wife. <laughs> she's really spirited to human beings. She's incredibly, like, sort of beautiful and smart. I like it because, yeah, I do. It's very, very engaging and diverting and I have to focus and concentrate and they change moods, tell you what to wear. It's not what I thought it would be. <laughs> how, how easy have you found married life? Be honest. Well, it's difficult to get used to one person. Like, you have to live in the same house with them every day. <laughs> They've got the same rights over the stuff as you. Like, like, say she leaves stuff on the ground, I just got to live with that. And, like, and if I leave stuff on the floor, I have to pick it up. That's confusing. <laughs> <laughs> but I imagine you're implying the changing activity physical-wise. If you want to go there, yes. No. So, <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean... The reason I'm asking is you're two, two huge stars, mm. so you've got huge pressures on your time. So I've no idea how much time you actually get together. How much, how much do you spend together? Quite a lot, actually. I was with her today, and then, like, uh, I see her again tonight, and then we're off for a couple of days together. I see her quite a lot, all the time when you're married with someone. That's it. You've got to like it or lump it. <laughs> <laughs> They're always around. <laughs> there she is in the kitchen. There was a report that you'd seen marriage counsellors. Is that true? No. I don't know where... A lot of this stuff, I don't know where it comes from, Piers. Like, I've stopped reading stuff in the papers. I don't even Google my own name, and that was my favourite hobby. <laughs> <laughs> don't do it anymore. Gone forever. Right now, don't do it. In the year to May 2006, you were mentioned 75 times in the UK national press. You then had Doesn't a... seem like enough. <laughs> it, it wasn't. Good. So then you began a, a hot little romance with a certain supermodel called oh, Kate yeah. Moss. The following year, you were mentioned 1,860 times. Well, it's difficult to argue with the statistics. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know the rules of being famous yet. So, like, sort of returns to go, so you're going to have Kate Moss? I go, yeah, she's amazing! Have you seen her? <laughs> I got excited. Like, it was like going out with the best-looking girl at school. Yeah. So I didn't know how to deal with it. But then you quickly learn, like, when you're talking to the press, just go, no comment, no, I don't know. Like, don't give them anything. You can't, because otherwise they'll tuck you up with it. I thought that this would give us an excuse to go through some of the more outlandish stories about you at the time. Right. To just work out if any of these in the last few years are actually true. During the 2002 May Day protests, mm. did you strip naked in Piccadilly Circus? Yeah, that was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to know, Piers, I was taking, you, you must know this for a number of reasons. I was on, a, like, then remember I was a drug addict. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not using it as an excuse for everything, I'm just using it as an excuse for this. <laughs> I was on a lot of drugs, I wasn't thinking straight, I was showing off. Like, they make you go daft, crack, mm. heroin, you make terrible decisions. And I was showing off in the middle of Piccadilly Circus by the Statue of Eros, took my trousers and pants down all in front of the police. And what, can I just say, even though it's May the 1st, it was very, very cold that day. <laughs> <laughs> While flying to America for treatment for your sex addiction, did you chat up the air hostesses on the plane? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I thought this was my last chance. <laughs> Unless I get a really pretty cab driver. <laughs> <laughs> the 
Russell, there was to be one story that rocketed you into a whole other realm of fame stroke infamy. Russell Brand has had an extraordinary rise to fame, from unemployable junkie to one of the most famous faces in Britain. He's a rock and roll comedian. He's, he, he lives very, very fast. I've got to quash these rumours. I've got to quash these rumours. I'm a chuffing fairy. I never am a chuffing fairy. Russell did actually say to me once that if I don't get famous, I will kill myself. To be famous, I think, means everything to him. And he's quite, he's quite open about that. I kind of like it because it gets me in places for free and all that, but he fucking loves it. With his striking good looks and outrageous dress sense, he's hard to ignore. I've seen him once. I think he had three belts on. Who wears three belts? I think he was about 14 and he loved Oscar Wilde. Actually, I think he was younger. And he asked for a paisley dressing gown so he could look like Oscar Wilde, which this is when I really knew he was a bit different. The Motormouth comedian has shocked and entertained with his antics. I think for Russell, the worst case scenario is not being bad. I think the worst case scenario is being ignored. I know America to be a forward thinking country, right? Because otherwise, you know, would you have let that cowboy fella be present for eight years? But for many, Russell is most famous for a radio broadcast, which nearly ruined his career and changed the BBC forever. Russell Brand's resignation came just hours after the BBC took him and Jonathan Ross off the air. There had been a running joke on the show that Russell had slept with Andrew Sachs's granddaughter. This running joke was just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so now we're going to be calling up Andrew Sachs. So this is going to be absolutely hilarious because the audience know the joke. It's going to be the elephant in the room. It never gets mentioned as you're speaking to Andrew Sachs. This is going to be really funny. And <laughs> Andrew Sachs, <laughs> Andrew Sachs didn't answer the phone. So it went straight to voicemail. Men, uh, Andrew Sachs. Don't call him Manuel, that's but really just, bad. Call him man. Andrew Sachs. No, I apologise. said Russell. Andrew Sachs. He, he's an idiot. Look, Andrew Sachs, I've got respect for you and your lineage and progeny. No, you no, never no, let no, that be questioned. Don't hint. I was not hinting. Why did that come across as a hint? Because you know what you're doing. That wasn't a hint. Now when... It was then suggested that Russell had had sex with Andrew Sachs' granddaughter. At this point, I was probably stood up uh, with my mouth as far open as it could be. Russell's initial intention was, we'll call Andrew Sachs back to apologise, and that is exactly what he did. But Russell, being Russell, decided to turn it into a song. I'd like to apologise for these terrible yeah, attacks, bump. Andrew Sachs. Bump, bump. I mean, he sings a song in apology to Andrew Sachs. Yeah, in which he rhymes consensual and menstrual. Challenge anyone to come up with that rhyme in ad lib. It's unbelievable. I'm not saying it wasn't totally idiotic what they did. And boys, when they're together, can be really, really stupid. And they were incredibly stupid. I still, to this day, find it absolutely amazing because there must have been hundreds of thousands of things going on in the world, dreadful things and Russell and Jonathan were making headline news day after day. People got upset that, you know, they rang up the grandfather of uh, the girl and exposed the girl. That was bad. So, obviously, a huge scandal. Um, Let's cut to the quick. I mean, who made that decision to leave the answer machine messages in the programme? <clears throat> Me. Are you just taking the rap? Because it's easier. Well, no, because really, if it's the Russell Brand radio show, I'm Russell Brand, you know, so it's my responsibility. So, yeah, completely. And the people that worked with me, they were dedicated to making me happy and they were dedicated to fulfilling what I wanted to happen. So if I thought that something was funny and thought that something should be left in a show, they would do it. It's completely my responsibility. Do you still find it funny? No, it was wrong to do that. I realise now that... Like, my mate Matt put it best. He goes, I know, in your head, when you left that phone call, 
you was leaving it for a bloke in a white jacket holding a, t a tray going, Keh? Like that. And that is what it was. I just thought, it's Manuel. From, I didn't think, oh, Andrew Sachs is a person with concerns and stuff like that. We just got caught up, we just got caught up in the moment because I was just showing off, trying to make I mean, people laugh. Although you take responsibility, it was Jonathan that said the line that really caused the offence. It was him that shouted out on the answer machine message, you know, Russell Brand slept with your granddaughter. And he used, a, he used an F word to describe that. It was that that shocked people, really, wasn't it? I don't know what shocks other people, Piers. I can only take responsibility for my role in the situation. Clearly, people were very disappointed in both of us. When it was at its absolute firestorm, this, did any part of you think your career might be over? Well, at the time, I was much more concerned by how the situation was being perceived and how all-encompassing it was. Um, well, I, to be honest, and I hope this doesn't in any way sound... Uh, impolite or in any way cavalier, but I knew that I was doing. Like, I was off to do a film with Helen Mirren, like like a couple of days later, and I knew I had another film to look. I knew that I was doing sort of different things. I thought that perhaps my radio career may struggle to continue, or, and, and uh, I thought there was little chance of me being cast in a Forty Towers remake. <laughs> <laughs> but I did feel that I thought if I carry on working and if I am genuinely sorry, which I am, mm. then I think eventually I probably that people will forgive me. I hope. Saxgate wasn't the only controversy you went through that year. Months before, you'd actually got into huge trouble at the MTV Awards by calling President George W. Bush a retarded cowboy. No, it was a good joke. It went like... <laughs> it goes, uh, like, it goes, um, you know, cos I was... This is what I thought. Oh, these people are watching MTV, so they're bound to be sort of liberal, cool people, I thought. I misjudged that. Again, I shouldn't be allowed to make my own decisions. <laughs> <laughs> they're coming rapidly apparent. <laughs> but I thought, there'll be everyone here, they're not going to want George W. Bush, all that craziness. They're not going to want him being in charge. They'll want Barack Obama, as yet weren't currently the president of America. So I thought, well, I'll stick up for that Barack Obama. Get everyone on side. <laughs> That's what I thought I was doing. So I goes, uh, oh, I know that you're next... You know, people say that America's not ready for a black president, but I know America to be a free-thinking, forward-thinking, liberal country. After all, you've had that retarded cowboy fella in the White House for eight years. <laughs> I thought that was like a musical funny joke, right? <laughs> then no one laughed. <laughs> what did you think in that moment? I thought, is this thing on? <laughs> <laughs> and then I thought, oh, I seem to have misjudged the political sensibilities of this nation. Mm. But I put it in a much shorter word of, oh, no, shit. <laughs> <laughs> What do you think when you look at that picture? I think, oh, you poor little sod. See that Cubs uniform? Not one badge. <laughs> <laughs> if you hadn't gone into rehab, what do you think would have happened? What Chip goes, he goes, if you, you need to stop taking drugs right now, or in six months you'll be in prison, a lunatic asylum, or dead. Surprisingly, for someone who's so obviously confident now as a performer, when you grew up in Greys in Essex, you were actually quite a shy boy, weren't you? Yeah, I was shy, because I come from a culture where if you're not good at football and or fighting, you ain't got much. And were you, you know? good at either? No. <laughs> <laughs> there you are. Now, look at that little At that face. time, I was part of Fight Club Essex. <laughs> <laughs> I was a pretty tough brawler there. <laughs> Knuckles, they called me. <laughs> What do, you, what do you think when you look at that picture? I think, oh, you poor little sod. That was, I was at the beginning of my journey. Look, see that Cubs uniform? Not one badge. <laughs> <laughs> your mum, Barbara, and your dad, Ron, separated when you were only six months old. Yeah. What kind of relationship did you have with your father? He was like... I thought he was the coolest man in the world. He's super funny, flash, loved women, like, turn up. So sometimes he'd have loads of money, be proper flash, flush, turn up at my school, loaded in a pool. Russell! <laughs> like, oh, my God, this man's so cool. But then, like, he'd blow it and, like, be living at my nan's in Dagenham again in a terrace house. Did, you, I mean, did he ever tell you that he loved you? Yeah, he was a good... Like, he's an, in no way a villain, that fella, my dad. He was really sort of... He's just like... What, now, as I get older, I realise it's... He didn't have a dad himself. He was... You know, his dad died when he was a kid. So he sort of... He didn't get a manual, you know? So I think that he tried his best. Your mum, who you love dearly, and I've seen you, I saw you at the Oscars with your mum proudly showing her off. That's only till I get an Oscar, then I'll show that off and get him clear <laughs> off. <laughs> when you were seven, she uh, was told she had cancer, and she then got two more bouts of cancer through your, your youth. 
what are your memories of that? That must have been a particularly scary time for a young Russell because your dad had left and there's your mum who's the, the rock of your family. Yeah. You must have thought, well, what happens if I lose her too? I did think that. I was a bit scared. I mean, when you're sort of seven, I think you're sort of, you know, you're childish, quite rightly, at seven. <laughs> so, like, I think I was obviously scared and concerned, but my mum, you know, did a great job of being strong for me. And again, when she was 11, when it hit me most was when I was like 16, 17. I think that probably made me go a bit loopy and in myself because I thought, right, this is it, it's just me. And I probably didn't think I had the right tools to get through life because I was a nutter. Did you have this kind of extraordinary energy when you were young? Yes, but it was a pain in the ass. <laughs> because that energy when you're a kid just makes you break windows and smash stuff and mm. go loopy. But when you... how, how badly behaved were you? Well, my mum, she'll go to her grave thinking I was an angel. But, like, uh, <laughs> like, but like uh, I was a naughty little boy, you know. But I think, cos I was... My mum always says, oh, he was so sweet, though, so you'd forgive him, mm. you know. But I would, like... I always used to think... Like, my, still now, my reaction when someone says, don't do that, I sort of think, why? Mm. You know, like, just sort of, like, can't get past that. I'd have a mistrust and of what authority. what kind of naughty things would Russell do, then? Just regular naughty stuff, like smashing windows, starting fires over the allotments, bunking off school, shoplifting, mm. that kind of, like, normal... <laughs> normal stuff. Yeah. yeah. So you were a classic rebellious teenager? Yeah, except probably I looked a bit weird. If I was casting a classic rebellious teenager for a, a film, I'd go much more Jimmy Dean rather than Roland from Grange Hill. <laughs> <laughs> when you were 16, you went to the Italia Conti, a famous uh, school for young actors. How did you change in that period, do you think? Well, that, I can't tell you what a relief that was. Because, you know, say, when you grow up in a place, you've got a certain reputation, right? Occasionally, I'd be popular at school because of being funny and having the guts to say rude things to teachers or whatever. People would think, oh, that's brilliant. But I was also, like, a fruitcake, so, like, the, the, it would oscillate my popularity. When I left that Italia Conti, I did a complete character reinvention. Like, like so, hi, I'm Sven! <laughs> 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 I just claimed to be a completely different bloke. But there was... About, this is just my memory, I might be exaggerating, but it was like there's about 400 birds, girls, and 10 blokes, half of whom were gay. Right? <laughs> it was just ridiculous. And those girls, it was like Tiffany out of EastEnders, Louise Redknapp, her out of Eternal, mm. Kelly Bryant, uh, loads of fit birds that went on to be in pop bands and, and soap operas. How many of those? Watch it, look at his, no, don't lose his instinct, does he? <laughs> Sees me counting women, he's on it like a bonnet. <laughs> Well, that would be ungentlemanly news. <laughs> you were invited to leave Italia Conti Drama School within a year. Yeah. What was that all about? Well, like, remember I told you there was only, like, five lads that mm. weren't gay there? Like, them five lads, they were... They, I just... They were a couple of years older than me, a couple of them from up north, a couple from East London. I thought, these were the coolest people. You know the first time you leave where you're from and you meet new people and they smoke pot and stuff, and they're, oh, my God, these people are so cool! <laughs> like, let me be your friend! And they, they realised that I was an asset to them because I would do anything to be their friend, so I just, like, started buying pot and stuff like that and skinning up with them badly. And I sort of, like, that was from the... Like, that's when I started to take drugs, really, when I was, like, that age. Probably. Is that why you were thrown out? Yeah, because they said, Russell, we've been here, like, they were all older than me, because we've been here a couple of years at this school, we've been taking drugs every day that we've been here, we've had no bother, you've had one joint, and everyone's, right, we're having an assembly, there's drugs in the school! Because <laughs> I was wandering around like Jim Morrison with my top off. <laughs> <laughs> wow, man, the, the bloody system! <laughs> Although you were a handful and increasingly unruly, for the time being, you were still almost employable. What are you going to do me for? Going equipped? I've got a right to a solicitor, ain't I? Sure. If you think it'll help. It was obvious that Russell had a talent for acting. The problem was, he would often turn up at drama school high on drugs. And in his final year, was kicked out for the second time. He was asked to leave because it was just... it wasn't working. And he was... and it was really upsetting because he, you know, it, it crushed him. And uh, it, was, it was sad to see him kind of walk away. But that's when he said, let's, you know, let's write comedy. But Russell quickly found his true vocation, late-night comedy. He was spotted by MTV executives who gave him his own show, Dance Floor Chart. When it said ladies on the door, I thought it just said, ladies, would you like a lady? Would you like to touch one? Sniff one round the tops of her legs? Wee wee nearer? I can always remember being slightly concerned because it was so outrageous I couldn't believe really that they allowed a lot of it to go to go on really. He's a bit drunk. 
literally have to push him home. Push him home? Oh, no! All the way home. He's so blinking late. We're dealing with people who, I guess, are sort of on drugs, so you can sort of be surreal with them and they'll possibly either appreciate it or it'll be funny watching the whole thing collapse. <laughs> By now, Russell had gone from recreational drug use to a serious heroin addiction and was losing all sense of judgment. Dressing up as Osama bin Laden on September the 12th, 2001, of all the choices of fancy dress you could ever choose on such a date, I would actually think that has to be the worst one. It's an absolutely outrageous thing to do. And that was the end of his career at MTV. I hurt myself today. Over the next 18 months, Russell's life spiraled out of control. He became unemployable. What have I become? But there was one man who'd met Russell and had seen something special. I got a phone call from him one day, on Thursday morning. And uh, he was a very different Russell Brand. He was scared and quite sad. It all fallen apart. And we arranged to meet. And he told me that he'd been sacked by everybody. So I said I would sign it. I didn't realise at the time that he was taking heroin and cocaine and bottles of vodka and bags of cannabis every day. I don't know how he managed to walk around. I used to be so frightened that I was going to get a phone call saying, you know, that something had happened to him. I loved him so much, I just wanted to see him happy. I couldn't bear to see how he got so low, so depressed, and you feel so incredibly helpless. There was a side to him that just wasn't, at that point, just wasn't very nice. You know, was really selfish and aggressive. He, he, he was sort of, you know, he was an addict and would have done anything to get his high. We have a Christmas party every year, and it was at that party that my son Nick caught Russell taking heroin in the toilets. That was the final straw. It was obvious that Russell needed help, and he agreed to meet a drugs counsellor. The verdict was damning. There's no such thing as an old junkie, and I think uh, he, you know, he was heading in, in the direction of being really messed up. Chip said that if he carries on this way, he might not be around in six months' time, so basically got Russell in a corner and said, you have to do something. If you hadn't gone into rehab, what do you think would have happened? Well, like, as John and Chip said in that, uh, in your VT there, like, <clears throat> that I was, like, probably six months away from... What Chip goes, he goes, if you, you need to stop taking drugs right now, or in six months you'll be in prison, a lunatic asylum, or dead. And like, you know, and that's the first time anyone had said anything like that to me. And then I, I still thought, Pfft, rehab, that, I don't like the sound of that. Like, uh, and like, so, John... Right, like they took me in a room, Chip took me in a room with like, there was, people took me in the rooms a lot. It was a period of being took into rooms, <laughs> right, for dressing down. Chip took me in a room, I'd just been in a room and all, and he took me in another <laughs> one. And he goes like, Russell needs to go away, because he's do lally. He goes to John like, you know, but he's got to, he's got to want to go for himself, you know, he's got to, like, the thing with drug addiction is the person themselves has to make that choice, because he's got to come from within, you know. And, and I goes, yeah, I don't think I fancy it. And John went, fuck that, you're going. <laughs> and John just like, that's it, I just was packed off. Why did you get so completely hooked on drugs, do you think, looking back? One of my girlfriends said to me when I was, like, she'd noticed early on when I was, like, 19, she goes, like, you want to be careful going out of them, lads, because I was hanging out with, like, my mates who were sort of doing drugs as well. And she goes, because they just wake up the next day and, like, sort of splash cold water in their face and get on with it. And she goes, and you're just, like, a sort of a broken bird man, mm. you know? And, like, so for me, it was, it was heavy. Like, I n sort of needed it. I was looking to solve external prob internal problems externally. I approached it like medicine. I approached it like it could cure me. Are you now ashamed of all the drugs you took? No, not really. I mean, it's a stupid time, but I was the... Ma I, of course, I hurt a lot of people. I hurt a lot of people around me, and I'm embarrassed and sad, and uh, I feel sorry that I've done those things. Was there a moment when you went, that's it? Yeah. Enough? Well, like... Yeah, I mean, sort of, not long after John said, you're fucking going, like, you know, and John sort of forced me, 
like, I had this like moment where I just stood for the first time in my life. I like just left John's office and I looked out and it was like one of them lovely winter days we get here in England where the sky is beautiful and clear and there's like tr trees, bare trees like across the sky. And it's sort of cold but nice cold, English cold. And I like, looked in the sky and, I, and the first time in my life, I thought, I suppose you don't have to take drugs every day. And that's like literally the first time that had ever occurred to me because I was a little kid. Then I was a drug addict. And then I stopped. There was never a transition. I went from childhood into drug addiction without stopping to think about whether it was a good idea or not. I would imagine in your new life as a Hollywood star, I mean, you've got lots of parties, there will be drugs around. There'll be people taking drugs. The offers will come your way again. Is it, is it like the little, you know, red devil on the shoulder? Not really, because I just straight away, because my, like, my, it's an important part of my life, and people go, oh, mate, do you want a line? Or whatever. I just go, no, you're all right, thank you. The sun named you its, its prestigious award, the Shagger of the Year, twice. Three times, I'm not complaining about that. <laughs>always stood you in good stead is your very flamboyant appearance and particularly your what used to be unfeasibly large hair is now slightly calmed down how important was the brand barnet to you i really like there it, it is it is it's a heyday I took it too bloody seriously i think i got really swept up in that i just think that you know what i've got I've, i think in retrospect not at the time i didn't think this but i think in retrospect i've not been off drugs that long i was still kind of a nervous guy so i think i just like to think i'll oh, create a bit of an identity for yourself that protects you you know, and part of it was that ludicrous haircut. And I oddly thought it looked so cool. <laughs> I just thought, this is such a cool haircut to have. I would see my reflection and think, there you go, looking really cool. And now, it's like when you look at other people's wedding pictures, like your mum's wedding pictures or whatever, I go, what's everyone wearing them ties for? What's everyone wearing them for? <laughs> but it's only six months ago. There's always been this kind of dandy element to your look, hasn't there? Byron... Wild, that kind of thing. But really, Byron and Wild Piers, it's like, of course, that, you know, because of the nature of, of the celebrity culture that we now find ourselves enmeshed in, people say, oh, Byron, he looked like a dandy, wild, dressed crazy. They wrote amazing stuff. Mm. They used language beautifully. Like, for, if you read Oscar Wilde, right, Oscar Wilde was what, the first time, like, it was one of those things that people tell you to read, and then you read it and it's not boring. Mm. Like, I thought, oh my God, this is actually funny. Like, and, like that for me was incredible relief. When I was a bit older, I learned to appreciate. Byron and the deep melancholy and the pathos and the passion. But first, all I cared about was if stuff was funny. So, like, Oscar Wilde, I thought, this bloke was properly hilariously funny. And then when you read his children's stories, they're so heartfelt and beautiful and magical, and he died as a result of being banged up for a bit of bumming. <laughs> 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 Just expressing himself with someone he fancied. <laughs> <laughs> what a caper. Where's the justice? <laughs> how, how vain are you? I don't really... Like vanity very much, but I guess I sort of it, when you work in show business, it's something that's a little bit encouraged. It's a kind of shallow thing, isn't it, to be vain? So I mean, I always imagine that you take a lot of time and trouble over your appearance. Well, I try not to take it too bloody seriously, but you know, sort who, of... who takes longer in the bathroom, you or Katie? Oh, uh, really? <laughs> unbelievable. I had no idea what went on. I weren't normally around for that bit. <laughs> So, Russell, you say you don't really care that much about your looks, but whatever you do do, it works. Thanks. <laughs> After rehab, Russell was slowly rebuilding his career when the chance came up to host a live TV show. Shut itself. This is Big Brother's Big Mouth! Channel 4, we were very concerned about taking him on. They thought he might do something like flush his penis or say fuck at the wrong time, you know. Hello, baby! All loud, then my willy done a burp and the plane crashed. I felt like a right tip. We gave them certain assurances that he would be fine, and if he wasn't, we'd pay the fees back. Good news, everyone! My ball bags have been given a record deal as part of a new boy band. Sometimes you take a risk on someone who their life might not be in the best place, but you can feel and see their talent and ability. Some must be annihilated! And that's what you do in television. You make those choices and you take risks. The risks paid off. Russell proved a huge hit with the viewers. I'm not sure why I was even watching that programme, but anyway, on he comes. <laughs> Me and my missus turned to each other and said, he's quite funny, isn't he? Who's that guy? It was almost like he, he'd found a platform by which he could engage with the public. Come on, then, what's your effing question? He was on his way. He knew that. And that gave him power. Shut up! 
the show was renowned for its chaos, and at the heart of it all was Russell. The swine! There was a lot of heat around Russell at that time in terms of his popularity, the excitement people felt about him as a comedian, how distinctive he was, how intelligent he was, and I think that was a big breakthrough moment for him. I remember one day we were in the studio and the girls started walking by, and our tummy turned as I thought it then, because they started screaming and shouting to Russell, and I thought, wow, this really is it now. This is the effect that he's going to have on women. His newfound fame made pulling even easier. Russell was like a child in a sweet shop. Ah, oh, I know why women like him, absolutely. Women like him because he loves women, and he has loved women in many different ways and forms. When I met him, he was having sex with five or six women a day. He was a conveyor belt of kind of faceless, nameless bodies. Russell was having sex with so many beautiful women that every so often he would have sex with very non-beautiful women, uh, just as a sort of palate cleanser. <laughs> But a chance meeting with a certain supermodel turned Russell from Z to A-list. When he first became prominent in the tabloids, he was uh, he was putting it about a bit, wasn't he? And then he hit the jackpot with Kate Moss, and then the rest is it. History, isn't it? Now that you're happily married and settled and you found the right woman, do you slightly... W I detected a slight wincing there at some of your old mates talking about the old Russell. Oh, well, like, it makes me look bad. Not that it makes you look bad, but just because you've changed yourself and you have calmed down a bit and you're not on that conveyor belt, as they mm. put it. That I you wasn't feel... on the conveyor belt. I was in the middle. <laughs> the conveyor belt was going by. <laughs> Cuddly toy. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, just, I was, um, they did, didn't they? In their droves. I mean, this is what's extraordinary. Yeah, I was what, just so What enthusiastic. was your success rate like? Do the audience want to hear that, that sort of stuff? Yes. Yeah. All right, well, don't judge me after. No. Because there's a bit where I thought, don't say anything. Mm. Well, there's certain <laughs> practical considerations. Really, any more than, like, me, I'm mm. the neutral. Any more than three others, then <laughs> what you're essentially in is like a French farce where there's doors slamming and plates spinning. <laughs> it's too much going on. It's very hard to manage that kind of situation. It becomes <laughs> more like a sort of Olympic event. <laughs> where you don't, even the enjoyment goes out of it a bit. <laughs> the inaugural Russell Brand Easter hot tub party was chaos. <laughs> I said, that's no way to celebrate Easter. <laughs> well, I mean, at one stage, you were treated for sexual addiction. Is that true? Yeah, another place I got booted off to by John Noel. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean... Were you addicted I to sex? I don't think so, really. I think I was just, like, addicted to living. Just like anything you put in front of me. Oh, all right, let's get amongst it, do it properly, you know? You told me at the time you were having sex at least 20 times a week. I can't believe it. Especially now I'm married. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bloody good gardener. <laughs> You touched on your sort of media stereotype that quickly developed after that. The Sun named you its, its prestigious award, the Shagger of the Year, twice. Three times. I've not complained about that. <laughs> <laughs> I love that part of you again. You know, part of you loved it. Some bits are quite good. Shagger of the Year. You can tell people that at job interviews. <laughs> <laughs> Special skills. Well, did I mention the shagging? <laughs> yes, you did, Mr. Brand. Well, I, well, here's a certificate. <laughs> Look, your wife was less impressed with the title. She said that you were a professional prostitute before you met. Well, if she's misunderstood the nature of prostitution, no money changed hands. <laughs> <laughs> if I'd have known that there was a market for it. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's all right, because, like, she... I don't think, like, she, uh, dear old Katie, God love her, knew the uh, extremes of it, because I wasn't famous in America, when I met her, so like... Now she is familiar with the experience. Yeah, because I told her like an idiot. Mm. Mostly so that she would... I was, I was like, because I was just so dazzled by the change. But like, you can't really appreciate something that's not there, right? So I had to tell her, look what I'm not doing. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think you have it in you to genuinely go 
the rest of your life without having sex with another woman? Well, Piers, the way I live my life is just one day at a time. I do that in lots of ways. I do that for my recovery from drugs and alcohol. I do it with the way that I treat people. I don't look at things in terms of, like, the rest of my life. Of course, marriage is a bond for life, and I wouldn't have taken that bond unless I was absolutely certain in my heart and in my mind and in my spirit that that's what I wanted. But I think if you look at anything, like, for the rest of your life, it can be daunting. So I just think... Just take it one day at a time, because you don't live your whole life now. I haven't got to live it all today. I haven't got to, like, oh, no, I'm in the intensive care ward. Oh, there's a baby. You know, you just... <laughs> now I've just got to deal with you. <laughs> <laughs> That's enough. <laughs> the final logical piece of the jigsaw is children. Yeah, that'd be good, won't it? It's now based in Hollywood, and it's been an extraordinary transformation from the moment the Saxgate scandal blew up and, you know, you were off the radio and suddenly no one was quite sure what was happening with your career. Here we are, within two years, and you're a bona fide nine-movie Hollywood star. What's your dream role, do you think? Um, dream role? Salmon, bit of salad. <laughs> 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 Arctic. Um, <laughs> no, I think, uh, I don't know, it changes all the time, really. Sort of at the moment, Arthur was a, a phenomenal thing to do because. You love Dudley Moore. Love Dudley Cook. Moore. I mean, you worship those guys. Yes. I mean, that comedy, you're deadly serious, aren't you? Yes, very much so. So I've, like, it saved me in lots of ways. Like, when I was, I grew up watching 40 Towers, Falls and Horses, Blackout. I watched them things again and again and again, learned them all off by heart. You know, so for me, it's, um, like something I take very, very seriously. So to play a, a part that Dudley Moore has played, it's a, a tremendous honour. And to work with Dame Helen Mirren. She's really brilliant, isn't she? I'll tell you what's funny about her, though, right, Piers? When you say you're doing, like, in Arthur, which I was, with her, right? <laughs> we're in the middle of doing a scene, and I'm, like, doing some grandstanding and some showing off and saying something funny, and I look over at her, and it's like my two shots, so we're both in it. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm brilliant. Look at all these things I'm saying. She ain't doing anything, <laughs> right? And then when you watch it back, there's something about her face, or you'll move an eyebrow, and you only watch her. <laughs> <laughs> Trick! <laughs> what have been the, the real pinch me moments for you in Hollywood? Because, I mean, I've had a <laughs> I mean, Whenever I go, there's something happens. Pinch you me. Go... I'm not Duncan Norvell. <laughs> <laughs> pinch me, chase me. I mean, you know what I mean? Those moments when you go, wow. I can't believe that just I get happened. it more when I'm with my mum or something, because for me, it happens like a little step, little step, little step. You know, like, you don't notice it happening because it's made up of t little decisions, do the MTV What do you think your mum say to the Vanity Fair That's party That's where it kicked Oscars. off. When my mum met Tom Hanks, right? Yeah. Like, so, like, and I go to, to... I went, Tom Hanks, uh, this... Like, they, and I sort of introduced, and they sort of shook hands, and I went, and just after they went to shake hands, I went, That's my mum. And they went, Oh, come on, we're not doing it like that, come here! <laughs> Gave her a big hug, and my mum was like, Woo! <laughs> Tom Hanks. It was all properly, like, lovely, Tom Hanks. Your mum's hugging Forrest Gump. Hugging Forrest Gump. <laughs> Life is like a box of chocolates. <laughs> well, what about for you? What have been the surreal moments for you? Um, well, first of all, it was when they started to let me go in the players' lounge at West Ham, and I was able to go near players. And like, uh, but they're like just like young lads, aren't they? Yeah. So I always think that I go to them, and I think I'm meeting like Alan Devonshire or Bobby Moore or someone from like way back. They're all 19. But, <laughs> yeah, but they just go, well, thank you. Like, because for me, football's full of all this importance and what it signifies, what it signifies to the people, and what it is, and what it represents, and how it brings people together. And I sort of try and convey that to like Mark Noble, who's probably 22 year old sort of uh, West Ham midfielder. I go. Mark, what you have done for this club? <laughs> oh, thanks, Mike. Thanks. <laughs> Mark's not capable of receiving that kind of sentiment. What is your take on Hollywood? What do you actually make of the reality of Hollywood? As you get famous, you have, can have yes men that will just go, oh, that's a brilliant idea, and laugh. And I've met people like that. People around me, they're just rude to me the whole time. <laughs> You're not fucking doing that, mate. That's stupid. <laughs> like, people like, sort of, and, like, do you need that, you think? Yeah, I think you do. And, like, my mate Danny, I was going like, to read this thing of, like, uh, he like, does my security and that. I was like, going to read this thing on this American chat show for my book, and it was like I'd written this thing about dolphins, and I thought it was an amazing bit of writing, and I maintain, in fact, that it was. But I was sort of saying, dolphins, they're like liquid magic, <laughs> scorching the sea, these phantoms of the ocean. <laughs> Shall I read that bit, Danny? He goes, mate, I think the objective is to entertain them. That might bore them a fucking death. <laughs> <laughs> Five years ago, you were performing to 30 people in a pub. Now, you have your first Hollywood star vehicle. Let me 
assure you, if you are a little bit nervous, that I am famous in the United Kingdom, OK? When he first went to America, he would stare at people in Santa Monica, because that's probably where the most... Um, that's where most English people are shopping. He would stare at people till they recognised him. He's always wanted to be a film star. You know, as I said, we used to, like, walk up and down the streets, and he'd say, yeah, you know, one day I'm going to be some big, mega, mega film star, and you're just going, yeah, all right then, mate. You know, you can't even afford a cup of coffee. I believe that he would. I, I just knew he was going to be big one day. After memorable parts in films like Forgetting Sarah Marshall and Get Him to the Greek, Russell's dream of Hollywood superstardom was within reach. In America, they talk about the movies, talk about his stand-up, they have a completely different view of him. With new film Arthur... Hello, Arthur. Ah! Russell's established himself as one of the world's hottest movie Hudson. talents. Hudson! 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 What? Lesbian Simon and Garfunkel, 61st and Park. Look. Spotted, another of your wasted talents. What's your winky? When a film like that comes up, you need the right kind of actor to take that role. Ow! I know that Russell loved um, and was inspired by Dudley Moore. I'm a bad kitty. Stop it! <laughs> <laughs> My bed is made of magnets. Get me out of here! At least something in this room is attracted to you. To take on the role of Arthur, just to fill the, the shoes that have been made so famous by such a great comedian, that's a challenge. But, having said that, you know, he's young and he's of this time and he's up for it, you know. He'll jump in where angels fear to tread. There's one thing we know about Russell, is that he'll do that. <gasps> I'm not taking anything seriously at all. With his career flying high and his addictions behind him, the final piece of the jigsaw fell into place when he married the love of his life, Katy Perry. He said he'd met this girl that he really liked. I didn't know a huge amount about Katy. He was taking her out to dinner on a proper date. He said he was, he was nervous. He, his, his tummy was sore, he had butterflies in his tummy and he couldn't eat and I knew that she was going to be the one for Russell. Katie is so extraordinary, but they make, they are such an ordinary couple, they're just normal. He does quite a lot of er indoors style, uh, you know, uh, chat, uh, which suggests to me that he needs to tread sometimes a bit carefully uh, with Katie, uh, who I imagine keeps him in line, but he is a bloke who needs to be kept in line. Successful, clean, sober and settled down, he's happier than ever. But with his controversial days a thing of the past, will Russell become a tad boring? Russell has needed to be less controversial and will be less controversial, but I think will not be less funny and uh, less talented. I think that it's a very good thing that Russell Brand became famous in England first before he went to America. Because if he'd pulled that September the 12th stunt in America, <laughs> you would never have heard of him again. What's the best thing about being married, do you think? The stability of it, like having like, there's someone that's my friend, you know, like it's like, it's honestly, I, I know people, it's really hard, because I know that I was the same when I was looking at stuff in magazines, like Allo or Eat or like for them sort of magazines, but like, it's so normal, like of course the things on the surface, she's a pop star and I'm in films and that, it seems like different and glamorous, but what it boils down to is just, it's like, you know, me and her like in a room somewhere going, oh, you're right, what'd you do today, oh, you know, and like, what are we gonna do about that? And it just comes, oh, I'm worried about that cat. It just becomes chit-chat and normal and loving and support, you know? It's a very normal thing, and that's important for me because I don't think I've ever had it. I don't think I ever had a normal life. I think when I was a kid, it was all, yeah, my mum done a great job and done her best, but I was caught up in all sorts of chaos, and, you know? The final logical piece of the jigsaw is children. Yeah. That'd be good, won't it? I'm looking forward to it. Are you, but I don't... Are you working on this? No, not yet, because there's no rush, because I don't want to get to... Like, we're 
you know, we've not been married very long. Be, and she works loads, I work loads. And like, it's, I think it's, I'm still excited and enchanted by her. So, like, it'd be nice to, I think, you know, at the right time, though, I, you know, I think it'd be brilliant. What kind of father do you think you'd be? I like, I'm going to focus on it. Like, I'm going to try and remember all them things that I felt. And then when, if them things happen, like, I go, oh, well, you know, just try and steer them as best you can and try and remember what it felt like. But I think you should do that in your dealings with all people anyway. Just remember that everyone's the same as you. Well, the great advantage you'll have is there'll be literally absolutely nothing that a child of yours could possibly do that you haven't already done. That's true. <laughs> I'm going to have no recourse. <laughs> Expelled from school for drugs. Oh, well done. <laughs> You're on target. <laughs> Russell Brand, thank you very much. Cheers, please. <laughs>